Okay. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. As usual, I'm your host, MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, of course. Um, and tonight, uh, we're going to continue our study of the Bodhisattva path. That's an idea we've been working on now for a while. We've been reading a sutra very slowly, pretty much line by line. We've been reading a what would be called a Mahayana Buddhist Sutra that's about the Bodhisattva path. And where the Sutra has taken us lately is that the Buddha has been describing all of these different qualities of a Bodhisattva. So it's a great Sutra for learning kind of what the Bodhisattva path is all about, but also sort of what is a Bodhisattva like? In that way, what are the qualities of a bodhisattva? Um, and the theme for tonight's class, the particular aspect of the bodhisattva path that we're going to be talking about is called sambhara. So the bodhisattva sambhara, which is this idea of the supplies of a bodhisattva. It's a funny little term that gets thrown around every now and then. The term sambhara could be like equipment almost, like think of like a gym in a way, like all of the equipment. It's kind of like that, but it's also the idea if you were going to go on a journey, you would need supplies. So it's more about these, um, actually, sambhara is usually translated as spiritual supplies. Um, the word spiritual is always a little tricky, of course, like, you know, what do we exactly mean by that? But these are the supplies of a bodhisattva, um, or at least that's the theme that we're going to be looking at tonight. If you've been coming to Dharma Doors lately, you'll know that the way that the Buddha has been delivering these teachings is he started by talking about this just one quality of the Bodhisattva. Then he gave us two qualities of the Bodhisattva, and then three, and then four, and then five. And tonight, we will find out the six qualities of a Bodhisattva. And those six the way that they are described tonight in the sutra is that these are sort of the sambhara of the bodhisattva. These are the supplies, these six. But here's the thing about it. You, you've heard of, you already know these six because these are the six paramitas. So tonight's kind of the secret theme of tonight is the six paramitas, but to ref even to refer to the six paramitas as these supplies of the bodhisattva, it's already an interesting um, twist or an interesting way of thinking about these practices. On that note of these practices, be before I read any of this, I kind of want to do the thing where I talk about what I'm going to talk about, and then we'll talk about what we could talk about, and then I might tell you what we talked about. But just for those out, out there, if you don't know these, or if, or if you've, you've only heard them a few times, I think it's going to be really helpful to just quickly run you through the paramitas, even actually beginning with that very word paramita, and with then kind of some information then we're going to start reading the sutra, and we'll go one paramita at a time. So really quickly, if you're not familiar with this idea, or you know, if by chance you've never heard of this, these are called the six paramitas. And the word paramita literally means other shore. <laughs> and what that means in that sense, or what it signifies, is that within the world of Buddhism, no matter what kind of Buddhism you're talking about, they are always talking about samsara 
and nirvana. And the way that those two things are described are sort of these two shores in between the sea or river of transmigration. <laughs> and so one metaphor, one way of talking about Buddhism is about moving out of samsara and arriving on the cool shores of nirvana. <laughs> so we're trying to move, we're trying to get to the other shore. And so there are these six things that we can do to arrive at the other shore. And those are called paramitas because we arrive at the other shore by doing this. So that's what a paramita means. These are six practices that, well, you know, get you enlightened, um, make you a Buddha, um, get you Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the supreme highest state of awakening. That's all the idea of making it to the other shore. And then the idea is, is that there are these six practices that one can do to make it to the other shore. The first is called dana, giving. Generosity, but this idea of giving, rather than taking, hoarding in that way. So it's a practice to do that. Number two is called shila, uh, S, but with a accent, so sh, I-L-A. And that's the idea of self-control, discipline, morality. Um, for tonight, I want to remind you that basically the idea of Shila, it's wrapped up in the idea of precepts, sort of vows or uh, intentions that one sets, things like not being violent, being a truth speaker, things like that. That's all wrapped up in the second paramita, moral discipline or Shila. And then third, Kishanti, patience, sometimes translated as tolerance. We're going to learn more about that patience and tolerance idea tonight, but that's the idea of the third practice, being patient, in particular, sort of de like being patient with people, <laughs> being patient with other people's anger or things like that. So those are the first three practices. And then the next three practices start with virya, drive, determination, energy, get up and go. Those are all kind of ways to think of or translate virya. The English word vigor, in a way, virile and vigor all come from that root word of virya, the Sanskrit. So that's all wrapped up in this idea. Not being lazy is a way of also thinking about virya or drive. Number five, meditation, of course, but in particular, a type of meditation that would be called dhyana. But I kind of even for tonight want you to know that the fifth paramita is very much about mindfulness, what you might know as sati or smrti, but it's the progression of mindfulness bringing about a dhyanic state, bringing about a concentrated state of samadhi. Those three are kind of all part of the same complex that would just be called meditation. And then the sixth paramita, the sixth practice of the bodhisattva, or actually just the sixth practice, I have a word to say about that bodhisattva idea, but the sixth practice is pranya, wisdom, is basically the idea. Sometimes it's very, very, very associated with studying, like actually studying the Dharma, but you may know that pranya is a very particular type of wisdom, even often translated as transcendent wisdom. So, all right, so very quickly, those are the six paramitas. Now, what I want you to kind of know, of course, is that these, well, first of all, the very idea of paramita, 
is not a Mahayana Buddhist idea. It has always been a part of the Buddhist tradition. This idea that there are paramitas, that there are things that can deliver one to the other shore. And the six paramitas I just mentioned are pretty much always the paramitas. Sometimes there's some other ones here and there. Sometimes there's a few more. But in general, those are the six practices. Tonight, though, what we're going to kind of get into with this sutra, it's about the way a bodhisattva practices those six things. And what I mean is, is it's sort of like this, and I just want to give you a taste of this, and then it, the reading will kind of speak for itself in that way. But in the earliest kind of form of Buddhism, what would normally be called Hinayana versus Mahayana, and by the way, too, you know, this is right in line with kind of this series I've been doing on the Bodhisattva path, which has been really focused on accentuating what makes this bodhisattva mahayana thing that versus this maybe you know it as theravada or just kind of normal mindfulness practice or something like what makes this bodhisattva thing the bodhisattva thing well the idea is and I'm, i'll only mention it really with the first one and or meaning with about giving and then again i think the sutra will speak for itself but in the Hinayana, as it's called, the kind of early form of Buddhism, karmically speaking, there was a sense in which every individual sentient being is sort of dealing with their own karma in a certain way. And by karma, I just mean actions actions of the body, actions of the mouth, actions of the mind, the things that we think, the things that we say, and the things that we do, that's our, quote, karma, that we sort of are producing that karma. And the general sense is that this project of, call it enlightenment, call it awakening, whatever, but this project is sort of about, it has a lot to do with karma, but what I mean is how we act. It has a lot to do with how we act and what we say and how we think. But in early Buddhism, there was a way in which each of us was sort of working out our own habits, working out our own ways of acting in that sense. And what I mean is, take something like giving. In the early form of Buddhism, giving is a, is a virtue. It is a great, wonderful thing to give. And it is lauded by the Buddha as a, you know, virtuous practice. But in the early form of Buddhism, the idea was that if I were to give you something, I've done something to affect my karma, meaning that I maybe, let's say I had a habit, and that habit was to hoard, to only look out for myself, to only, you know, sort of cling and grasp and, you know, hoard. And there's a way in which you can get very good at that. <laughs> If you practice it enough, you can get very good at doing that. And so the idea is, is that we are all, or to varying degrees, we are all sort of very good at looking out for ourselves. It's sort of the default mode in that way. And so in terms of this practice, to make an offering, to give something, it, trend, it, it changes that karmic habit. And then if it's like, if you gave something again, you're reinforcing that habit of generosity. And so the idea is, is that you are make, now you're making moves towards a different reality in that sense. And if you eventually 
kind of clear out that particular poison, that particular defilement or klesha, which is this kind of graspy, clingy, wanty, cr cravey klesha, if you eventually kind of clear that out and you're kind of in total generosity mode, then you've sort of dealt with that klesha. And then you could do the same with anger and you could do the same with delusion, eventually clear all those out. And then that would be reaching the goal, maybe becoming an arhat, attaining nirvana, the cessation of suffering. There's a lot to that process. But what I want you to kind of notice is that in the description I just gave you of that process, it's entirely only about the individual dealing with their karmic state. What we're going to learn or read and then learn about is how the bodhisattva is involved in the exact same kind of practice in that sense, which is the practice of being generous, the practice of giving, this practice of dana. But the major difference, and it's a huge difference, the bodhisattva's mentality is not about themselves, their own karmic condition, and what it is they're doing in that sense to reconcile their karmic condition. The attitude and the disposition of the bodhisattva is that in the giving, it's for the benefit of everyone. It has this deep sense that this is not for my enlightenment. And we'll get to this hopefully a little bit later. The bodhisattva through wisdom understands that, that, that the other way, meaning the way where we're only interested in our own practice and our own cultivation and our own state of liberation, there's a way in which that is very myopic, so to speak. It's very narrow in that it's only looking at the self in that way. And from a Mahayana point of view, as virtuous as that practice is, it's still going to continue reinforcing a certain sense of self. And so the, a real awakening, a true liberation may be accomplished also through giving, but through giving in a very, with a very different attitude, if you will. And it's not to say any form of giving isn't good. All forms of giving are good. But this bodhisattva path where you're giving at this sort of higher level in that way, there's just something a little bit more to it. And I think the sutra tonight will really clarify like the mentality of the bodhisattva in that way. Okay, so that's just sort of basically the way that I kind of suggest thinking about the reading tonight is that this is like a revamping of this very old Buddhist idea and then giving it in terms of the bodhisattva path. Um, this is a little longer than we've read before. So I'm gonna read them one, one at a time. So I'm gonna uh, read the first about, about dana, about generosity. Um, once again, I, if you didn't, if you weren't here before, let me just let you know, there's only one complete English translation of this sutra. It's an English translation from Tibetan. And that's what I kind of have been referring to mostly in reading. However, as most of you know, I'm working on a alternate translation from the original Chinese version, which is actually a much older version than the Tibetan, a much kind of more, I dare I say, original version in that way. The two are remarkably uh, close. I'll, I'll have you know, though, it's really amazing. These things always amaze me, by the way, a little, little bracketed aside here. As a translator, I have to tell you, knowing the kind of the history of these two documents, like knowing where and when the Tibetan comes from, where and when the Chinese comes from and all of that, 
you would really think there were a lot, there should be a lot more differences to these texts. And what I mean is, is that if you've ever thought about, and you probably have thought about what we call the telephone game, like that I tell you something and then the next person tells somebody else and that person tells somebody else. And by the time you're at, at the end of the telephone line, it's a completely different message. And the presumption is, is that history works the same way, that whatever message the Buddha gave must have been, gone through the telephone game so many times. But when you compare these texts, again, it's remarkable the degree to which they line up almost word for word. And so when they differ, it's always actually very interesting from a scholastic point of view. Um, so on that note, I've basically managed to create what a kind of nice translation of my own of the first three of these. I didn't get around to the next th three. So what you're about to hear is kind of a hybrid of the Tibetan and the Chinese and English and all of that. So, and a bunch of uh, Michaelisms, of course, as usual. So, okay. So, uh, anything going into this? Any questions, comments, answers, ideas before we dive in? No? Yeah, I'm curious why you think the texts are so similar, given what you just said, that they should be more different. Because these are deeply, deeply pious faithful people that think it would be the most tremendous harm to mm -hmm. change a word mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the amount of diligence that they go to to preserving it, it mm -hmm. yeah and so is that why the differences are so important because you, you figure they are in some sense very deliberate and have to do with a different understanding exactly and i plan to point out a few of those tonight just if, if it Thank seems you. relevant all right. Thanks, Noam. Um, cool. So, furthermore, uh, a man, of course, uh, the Buddha is talking to a monk, Shariputra, who really represents that earlier Hinayana tradition. And so he says, furthermore, Shariputra, bodhisattvas um, who achieve six things, uh, of course, fulfill their kind of vow. That's what this whole sutra has been about, about the bodhisattva fulfilling their vow in that way. And so what are these six? Number one, these bodhisattvas are great donors, giving whatever rare, precious, desirable things they have, giving them gladly, without regret. And they think, I am practicing the great giving to fulfill the great vehicle, the Mahayana. When searching for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, supreme unsurpassable awakening, every instance of relinquishment without grasping allows the Bodhisattva to fully achieve the Bodhi Sambhara, the supplies for awakening. They think, I relinquish my own body, my own life, and still no regret arises. <laughs> what is there to say about giving away wealth and possessions, even spouses and children? Shariputra, why are the Tathagatas, the thus come ones, called Sarvanya? the all-knowing, because when they performed the practices of a bodhisattva, they themselves relinquished everything. It is for this reason that when they attain awakening, they are called sarvanya, the all-knowing. Okay, so that's the first one on the bodhisattva who achieves this state of being a great donor. This text mentions it, it calls it, it says that the bodhisattva says, I'm practicing the mahadana, the great giving, in order to fulfill the great vehicle, the Mahayana. 
So there's a kind of a beautiful poetic um, pairing there of the great dana, the great giving. But I want you to know that when I made my kind of opening remarks and I said this idea of that giving has always been a part of the Buddhist tradition. So in a text like this, and you usually see this in Bodhisattva texts like this, to differentiate these two different kinds of giving, they usually refer to this as the great giving. And that's the giving that isn't giving for the little brownie points of merit. That little like, ooh, I'll, I get to go to heaven or I even might make it to wherever. It's like actual, true, for real, selfless giving in that way. With the mindset of benefiting all in the process. Again, it's just a, a very different mentality in that way. Um, we got the mention of the Bodhisattva supplies, which <clears throat> I'll use this moment to mention this. Another th interesting thing that the Mahayana tradition does with the six paramitas is these are very, um, how would I say, these, at least as they're presented in the this text and Mahayana texts, the six paramitas are progressive, meaning the first allows for the second and accomplishment of the second allows for the third and the fourth and the fifth and then the sixth in that way. And so what I'm, what I kind of want to just mention, it, it was sort of the, the inspiration for tonight's Dharma talk of like, why, why make this about this sambhara, the, the supplies? I want you to notice, at least in the Chinese, it's, I, I would really, I, I have to learn Tibetan. It's like, that's it. I got to do it because I really would want to know what exactly the words are in the Tibetan, because this idea of the sambhara is so important or you notice a lot. And I'm curious if it's missing in the Tibetan, but in the Chinese, what we notice is by this truly magnanimous giving, where it's giving everything away, including body and life. And I want to talk about that in a second. But in this great giving, the Mahadana that gives everything away, spouses and children and everything else, one then sort of acquires these sambhara. And so what I mean is, is that there's a really kind of beautiful little poetic thing about, you know, you would think that you'd be left with nothing if you gave everything away to everybody, is my point. And so the idea is, is that the bodhisattva by giving is now equipped with these virtues in that way. So we've kind of made this exchange. We've given up our worldly possessions in that sense in order to kind of get equipped for the journey of the Bodhisattva. So one note about, and this refers back to the whole first part of the sutra that we haven't talked about now for weeks and weeks and weeks. But when it's talking about relinquishing and being without attachment to and giving away all these all this stuff and then at the end you might have noticed giving away even spouses and children <laughs> from the earlier part of the sutra because this is part of the the bodhisattva canon this is part of the bodhisattva path what we know is that to relinquish doesn't necessarily literally mean <laughs> give away. In the Bodhisattva path, it is the relinquishment happens here in the, in the mind. It may happen with the body as well. 
like where you actually go to the goodwill or you actually go and give stuff away. It might have looked like that, but it is far more important for the bodhisattva to relinquish the attachment in their heart, as we would say. So I just want to make that clear that, that that's already been established in that sense. So, okay. Um, and then the last part, a word about Sarvanya, this beautiful kind of title for a Buddha, for the Buddha is Sarvanya, kind of the all-knowing one, Sarvanyana, but it's just Sarvanya. And you'll notice that, well, I, yeah, as this goes along, this will probably be important to mention. The Bodhisattva is mimicking the life of the Buddha. In the Hinayana, we follow the Buddha or the, the Arhats, the Shravakas, they are followers of a Buddha. There's already been a Buddha. He's appeared. He taught the Dharma. So follow the Dharma, get to Nirvana and suffering. Do not pass go. Do, you know, all, that's the idea. But <laughs> this um, Bodhisattva path, again, is just, it's got this different angle to it in that way. So that angle is not about following a Buddha, but actually becoming a Buddha. And that's what makes a Bodhisattva a Bodhisattva, is that they're in the business of becoming a Buddha, not just alleviating their own suffering in that way. And so that's where we get this, uh, it's a rhetorical question where the Buddha says, hey, Shariputra, why are Buddhas called Sarvanya? Well, when they performed the practices of a Bodhisattva, they relinquished their wife. Like if you look back to the story of Siddhartha, wife, child, home, status, everything. And that's why they're called the Sarvanya. And that's what the bodhisattva is in the business of doing as well. So, okay, paramita number two. Number two. So bodhisattvas at home, living at home, or bodhisattvas who have left home, having relinquished their bodies and their lives, they never break precepts. And this keeping of the precepts is for the benefit of all sentient beings and then transferred to Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Keeping precepts like this, there is self realization and joy, delighting in the cultivation of pure practices day and night, tranquilly, the bodhisattva continues to pursue the dharma and to abide in the cultivation of correct practices. Sated and fearful of the triple realm, they seek to find a way out. Seeing the importance of getting out, they consider other sentient beings and think to themselves, just as I suffer, so also do they. I should alleviate the weight of their burdens and embrace all sentient beings, creating a place for tranquil nirvana. And like this, when bodhisattvas keep the precepts self-realized and joyful, they catch the mind of great compassion, mahakarunya chitta, and will ever will and will even attain 
the unrelinquishing virya drive of all knowledge as if their head was on fire. <laughs> Period. <laughs> all right, so that's number two about shila, moral discipline. So there's a few things going on there. And this is one place where the Tibetan version, it really, I kind of, it has it in it. If you read it in, if you read the English version, it says a lot of this, but it just kind of misses emphasizing the, kind of the important parts. So the first thing I want to mention is that it starts and says, bodhisattvas living at home or bodhisattvas who are, have left home. And that's a really important, nice part of a sutra like this, because it's saying, whether you're the kind of bodhisattva who's still abiding in a, in a, whole, a householder, or you're the kind of bodhisattva that has left home, right? After number one, meaning after having relinquished bodies and lives, the bodhisattva never breaks precepts. That's the shila. That's the moral discipline part of this. But then it goes on to say something. And I got to tell you, the, the grammar here is a little hard to, the grammar's hard to put into English because of one particular word. And it's a word that I know is in the Tibetan because I, they translated it. But again, the emphasis isn't there. The word is pari namana. P-A-R-I-N-A-M-A, -A -A, parinamana. You know of this idea, or you probably know of this idea. It doesn't get spoken about it as parinamana, but the idea that you might know it as, or have heard it as, it's called the transference of merit. If you've ever heard of that idea of the transference of merit, the word transference is parinamana. And I want to tell you about parinamana because it's such an important part of the bodhisattva path. Oh, it's so important. It's, so <laughs> here's the idea. This, when you hear transference of merit, and by the way, the, the other way this is almost always translated is the dedication of merit. So this is a very common thing. It's very, very common, of course, in the Vajrayana tradition, but I want you to know it's also very common throughout East Asia, kind of just general Mahayana Buddhism. <clears throat> and the a basic idea is, ah, this gets so complicated. So I'm just going to tell you the basics, but then we're going to back up a lot. The basic idea is, is that if I do something good, if I do something meritorious, I generate punya, as it's called, merit, good merit. And there's a whole economy of merit in the Buddhist world. And when I say economy of merit, I, I mean that in all of its different uh, meanings, both kind of economic, but the original meaning of like the economia in that sense. But my point is, when you generate this punya, you can perform a kind of ritual or a kind of a thing where you dedicate or transfer that merit normally to all sentient beings. That is sort of the normal way to do it. Now, I have definitely seen and know about and have read about much more precise forms of dedication. And what I mean by that is, is that what happens in the world of Buddhism is that I can do something good. And then if you know, like, you know, my, my dad just lost his job and all of that. And so if something's wrong in our family, I can generate this goodwill or this punya and actually dedicate it to the welfare of 
my parents, which is very common in traditional Asian societies of, in terms of filial piety, very common to transfer it to ancestors. Um, of course, throughout Imperial China and Japan, it was very common to transfer or dedicate the merit to the emperor, to the long life of the emperor and things like that. So I want you to know that the, the I don't know what I would call it, but the practice of dedicating merit is complicated. It's a very old practice and it's referred to in our text here. So that's how you probably, if you've heard about it at all, you've heard about it as maybe doing something, generating merit, and then transferring it to all sentient beings. But here's the thing about parinamana. Yeah, it means, it means sort of transference in a way, but it's actually more of a really interesting kind of psychology in a way. And what I mean is, is this, the, what distinguishes the bodhisattva from the arhat, or again, from a practitioner of the Hinayana, the bodhisattva is a virtuous person. They don't, they don't break the precepts. So they're generating all of this punya. And the idea is, is that, that, that there's a kind of real reality to the, that generation of punya by that act. And so as a further aspect of the practice, the bodhisattva transforms that merit and in a sense then, yes, extends it or passes it on to all sentient beings in that way. Particularly, and it says it in the sutra, I don't know if you caught it, I read it in a kind of weird way, but in particular, the idea is, is this, and I'm going to give it to you in a really simple formula, but the idea is, is that if, if one can get enlightened, for lack of a better term, if one can get enlightened through generating punya, and the idea is, is that if I keep this up, if I keep up the moral discipline and I keep up the meditation and I keep generating all this punya, I can get enlightened. The bodhisattva generates all this punya and says, this is for everybody's enlightenment. Like not just mine, may this, may this help in that sense, all sentient beings reach awakening in that way. And what, and I don't want to dwell on it too long because I do want to get to the other paramitas, but the, I think a lot of you will really appreciate what's going on with the transference of merit, because if you really study the science of it, it's really dealing with a transactional mind that's very much in the business of a kind of tit for tat. Um, I gave you this, now you owe me this. And I like, everything's very, um, well, I don't want to call it capitalist in that way because capitalism has a very particular connotation to it. But I mean, that sense of everything being an exchange. The transference of merit works to counteract that way of practicing where it's like, oh, I meditated for 20 minutes today, check. So the idea is, it's like, yeah, meditate for 20 minutes and then transfer the merit of that practice to the benefit of all sentient beings and keep it moving in that sense. So, all right, everybody vibing on, on that difference? So again, it's the exact same practice in terms of keeping moral discipline, but with this different disposition of, oh, we're doing this for everybody in that way. Then we have the real mentality here, and this is going to be important when we move to the next uh, few of these, but it's about this idea of the bodhisattva cultivating this tranquil practice day and night. There's this beautiful term. It's the idea that the bodhisattva regarding the world 
they're full. They've had enough. I translated it as, as being sated, like being satisfied. I don't want to use the word satisfied because that's not the connotation. But it's this kind of really profound idea that the Bodhisattva, it's like, I'm good. I'm good with the worldly delights and all of that. I've had my full. I'm ready now. And so being sated of the triple realm, which is the realm of desire, the realm of form, and even the formless realm, the Bodhisattva seeks to find a way out. Seeing the importance of getting out, they consider other beings and they think, just as I suffer, so also do they. I should alleviate the weight of their burdens and parigraha, embrace all sentient beings, creating a place for tranquil nirvana. And then in that way, they generate what is called the mahakarunya, the great compassion. Not this kind of feeling bad for people, this kind of, uh, you know, oh, that's, oh, sorry to hear that. Not that compassion, maha compassion in that way. All right, everybody feeling good about number two? Number three. Now, number three is where we really get to the sambhara, this, these, uh, the supplies or the equipment that I was referring to. So number three is the bodhisattva or bodhisattvas cover themselves, it says, or in the Tibetan, they say dawn, but the bodhisattva covers themselves with the armor of patience, with the armor of kashanti, and free of righteous pride, they attain great strength of patience. If they should encounter any kind of scolding, they tolerate it. Even if they are struck or beaten, the patient mind that they have perfected does not give rise to hatred. Even if these people have clubs the size of Mount Maru and people bear them for millions of kalpas, constantly beating and scolding the bodhisattva, even then, their mind would not give rise to anger. How so? The Bodhisattva thinks all those sentient beings are not following the teachings of the Buddha, whereas I am following the teachings of the Buddha. For this reason, whatever beating or scolding there is, as it increases, so too shall my great compassion increase. I should cover myself in the armor of a vast vow, a vow to embrace all sentient beings for the sake of all sentient beings in order for the attainment of liberation and the entrance into nirvana. For this reason, I shouldn't be angry now. When bodhisattvas correctly abide in kashanti, in patience like this, they achieve 10 kinds of perfections. What are the 10? Perfection of status or caste or class or something like that. Wealth, perfection of wealth, perfection of a retinue, or social network, perfection of their characteristics of form, their excellent relinquishment, their excellent friends, their attainment of being able to hear the correct dharma, the being able to practice the correct dharma that they have heard. And when it comes time to pass away, 
they will get to see all the Buddhas. And number 10, having seen all the Buddhas, they will give rise to pure faith. These are the 10 kinds of perfections the Bodhisattva attains upon perfecting or achieving this Kshanti. All right, that's number three. And this is a term that you will hear often, which is the armor of patience. It's a beautiful term. It's a beautiful expression. In fact, even I've heard of the monastic robes often referred to as the armor of patience in that way. So this is, um, again, this is not just sort of waiting patiently in line at the bank. <laughs> it, this is not what we mean by patience. This is, you know, the idea here is, even if people come with clubs the size of mountains, yelling at you, scolding and beating, the mind does not give rise to anger. That's the essence of Kshanti. And I often, I mean, always like to make this clear. Kshanti is not about suffering abuse. Kshanti is about not giving rise to anger should one be abused. That's that's the practice. And by the way, of course, the opposite of this is getting angry. If somebody were to, were to scold you or call you names or whatever, the normal reaction, of course, is to get angry. That's the way we're conditioned. That's the default mode. And so the Bodhisattva's practice is one of not getting angry when that happens. And it's a practice for a reason, <laughs> because, again, we're working against a, a habit of doing that. So, um, and then we achieve these 10 things, but I just want to make it clear that it's not that the Bodhisattva, when, you know, and in the, in the Tibetan, they say, of course, that something like the Bodhisattva will achieve the perfection of their caste, and, and then this perfection of wealth. And I just want to make it clear, it's not saying that the Bodhisattva who's good at being patient is going to elevate to some upper class, you know, private jet or so. it's not saying that. It's more about, well, if we were to take just that first one, well, actually I won't say too much about this, but because I want to read some of the other ones tonight. But the basic idea is, is that the perfection of something like status or class from the Bodhisattva point of view, it's the unenlightened mode, which it's sort of about this hierarchy. I'm, I'm, I'm here, but I could be here. But then so-and-so has this much money and they're up there. So there's this status or caste or whatever game being played. It's the unenlightened that is sort of wrapped up in that hierarchical game to sort of transcend that in a way like a bodhisattva would is sort of the perfection of status when when you're not playing the game anymore you've perfected it in that sense same thing with wealth when it's not being defined by your bank account or by this or by that then you've perfected wealth in that way and you could do that with all 10 in that way, where they seem to be talking about one thing, but they're talking about it quite a different way. Okay, everybody good with the meaning of patience? Donning the armor of great patience? Cool. So, uh, now I am gonna switch over to just reading from the Tibetan, but again, with a few uh, alterations. The fourth paramita here that we're about to hear about is virya. Again, uh, vigor, determination, or drive. They have gone with diligence. 
I'm not a huge fan of diligence, so I'm going to swap that word out. But if you're reading the Tibetan at home or anything, just know that's the word. Additionally, Shariputra, bodhisattvas practice virya and maintain their commitments for the purpose of accomplishing the virtuous qualities of a bodhisattva. They give rise to virya with this thought. I'm willing to float along in the cyclical existence of samsara for millions of kalpas into the future in order to secure the welfare of each and every being. With such a method, with such diligence, with such conduct, with such tranquility, with such commitment, with such valor, with such compassion, the bodhisattva remains in samsara, cyclical existence, for kalpas, for the sake of all beings. They do so diligently thinking, I will never abandon these beings. Shariputra, consider those bodhisattvas who fill numerous Buddha lands, as numerous as the grains of sand in the Ganges River throughout the 10 directions, filling them all with the seven precious treasures, arousing an attitude of generosity. And based upon that outlook, they then engage in giving all of that wealth away to the thus come one, to the Tathagata, the worthy one, the perfect Buddhas, for millions and millions of kalpas in such a powerful manner as that, compared with such bodhisattvas that give away such treasures, bodhisattvas who arouse the armor of virya because they have perfectly pure motivation and great compassion, they will generate far greater merit than all the bodhisattvas that gave away the seven treasures. Shariputra, bodhisattvas who engage in virya will attain 10 positive qualities. What are these 10? They discard the conduct of childish beings. They assume the conduct of Buddhas. They develop a perception of the samsaric cycle as being flawed. They take a hold of great compassion. They don't go back on their promises. They have few illnesses. They act in accordance with the instructions of the Buddha's past, present, and future. They have little attachments, little aggression, little ignorance. They understand the meaning of the words and letters taught by the Buddhas and practice them earnestly. Shariputra, bodhisattvas who engage in virya attain those 10 positive qualities. All right, so the only thing that I wanna mention about virya in the Hinayana, in that model, virya is the, the get up and go and the drive that gets us to the meditation cushion. It's the drive that keeps us there. Even though we want to go watch a show or something, we put forth the effort and we wait out the 30 minute session. And that's drive, that's determination, showing up, doing the work. And there's a way in the Hinayana that if you don't show up and you don't do the work, nothing's gonna happen. So virya is a necessary paramita. It is a deliverance in that way. What I want you to notice again about the, the, the bodhisattva path here is a little different because now the bodhisattva, their practice of virya is actually vowing to keep going back into samsara until everybody else is liberated. That's their virya. That's their drive and determination. 
And that is definitely one of the, the hallmarks, if you will, of a bodhisattva, which is this kind of, when, whenever you hear that idea of, oh, the bodhisattva gets right up to nirvana, but decides not to go to nirvana until everybody else has come with them, it's more, it's more about this sort of, it's basically the idea from a meditative point of view is that a bodhisattva has reached a certain level where they could bounce out. <laughs> Bye everybody, good luck, I'm going to Nirvana. <laughs> and the idea that they don't, <laughs> They know, I think it mentioned it, I think in the last one, they perceive the flaws of samsara. That might have even been in this one. They perceive the flaw of samsara. Again, like the other one said, they're full, they're done, they're sated, they're good. They actually don't want to come back into samsara anymore, but are willing to keep coming back into samsara to get everybody out of samsara. I think there's a lot of different analogies you could come up with there. I mean, on a very practical level in terms of like, you know, somebody being liberated from a situation and being like, you know what? There's still people back in that non-liberated situation. I could just bounce, but I'm going to go back. That's a bodhisattva in that way. All right. Um, we have enough time. So I'd, and it would be really nice to get through all six. So everybody feeling okay? I want to leave anybody behind in the virya. Cool. So, yep. Additionally, Shariputra. Ah, really quickly before I read it, just to let you know, the fifth paramita is, of course, dhyana, or it's usually given as dhyana. But as I mentioned in the opening, it's sort of about mindfulness dhyana, and samadhi concentration. There's a bit of language that I'll tell you about really, really quickly. In a lot of sutras, you might read, and, and it says it in this one, you might read that bodhisattvas recall the Buddhas. They recall the Buddhas of the past, or they recall the Buddhas of the past, present, and future. So what's being translated as recall is the word, in Pali, it's sati, in Sanskrit, it's smrti, and in English, it's what we translate as mindfulness. You know, that practice of focused uh, concentration in that way. So in the world of Mahayana Buddhism, there is a practice of mindfulness, of sati, but it's not mindfulness of the body, or at least this physical body and sensations and, you know, uh, chitta or mind states and dharmas. There's mindfulness of the Buddha. So like as a focus of concentration. So I just want you to know that whenever you read about bodhisattvas recalling the Buddha, they're talking about doing a mindfulness practice on the concept of the Buddha, or on an image of the Buddha, or even maybe on a sutra description of the Buddha in that sense. So additionally, Shariputra, bodhisattvas are mindful of all the Buddhas, thinking the sugatas, the thus gone ones, are in samadhi, always in equipoise, never forgetful. So if I am going to follow in the footsteps of the thus gone ones, I will be unable to attain that level of Buddhahood if I am distracted and forgetful. I will therefore give up all these attachments all this clinging, all these attainments, all these honors, 
and all the attachments of villages and towns and cities, as well as all of the cravings for friends, for servants, for family, for the sake of all beings, I will never abandon them. Thinking in this way, Bodhisattva's delight in solitude and seclusion, living alone like a rhinoceros, living in solitude and seclusion, they will suffuse all beings in unison with love. In that way, they suffuse all beings throughout the 10 directions with an immeasurable attitude of love. Abiding in love, they develop samadhi concentration. Shariputra, moreover, compared with a householder bodhisattva serving the thus gone ones and the Sanghahav monks with everything pleasurable for as many kulpas as there are grains of sand in the Ganges River, Bodhisattvas who go forth and desiring seclusion take seven steps in the direction of the wilderness, they will generate far greater merit than a householder bodhisattva. Such bodhisattvas will attain awakening far more swiftly. Shariputra, there are 10 benefits enjoyed by bodhisattvas who live in solitude and seclusion. What are these 10? Such bodhisattvas are mindful, intelligent, wise, inspired, quick to attain eloquence, and quick to accomplish mnemonic aids or dharanis. Moreover, they become learned in birth and destruction never lose their collection of discipline, are honored by gods, and have no desire for the wealth of others. Shariputra, these are the 10 benefits enjoyed by bodhisattvas who live in solitude and develop samadhi concentration. Okay, so that's the fifth. So you may be thinking, but Michael, you said the sutras said there was the thing about householder bodhisattva and bodhisattvas that leave home and da 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 da. I know. <laughs> so the thing about it is, and especially if you you know you read a section like uh, what was it about? Um, not craving for, what was it, friends and family, things like that, right? So it's about this thing, and we've, we encountered this earlier in the sutra as well. It's about the bodhisattva who delights in the um, aranyacharya, the forest dwelling practice. This sutra has already made it very clear several times that it is in full support of silent, solitude meditation experiences. It's made that very clear. But again, I hope you notice that there's something very, very different going on here in that even though the, the Bodhisattva has removed themselves from society as it were, their entire meditation is about suffusing all sentient beings with metta, loving kindness, but you know, they translated it as, as love. So I'm going to, I'll read love. I'll read love all night long. I have no problem saying that in, in that way, like that that's the mentality or that's the attitude of the Bodhisattva. Yes, technically they're talking about metta or loving kindness in that way. But I just want you to notice that that's even the attitude of the Bodhisattva in seclusion is in this, in, uh, this transference of merit in that way. Just to refer back to the remarks I said earlier. One thing that I really wanna point out, I, I read it, but it, I, when I first read it, 
I, I was a little, I was truly moved by this. Okay. So I wanted to say a few words about that beautiful statement about the Bodhisattva desiring seclusion takes seven steps in the direction of the wilderness. So, you know, if you didn't pick up on that, that's a beautiful reference to the birth story of the Buddha. So the idea is, is that when the Buddha's mother, when she went to the Lumbini garden in Nepal to give birth to the Buddha, and the Buddha jumped out of her side, as they say, and took seven steps upon which these lotus flowers blossomed under the child's feet. And I have never heard this expression of taking seven steps in the direction of the wilderness, but it's clearly a beautiful reference to, again, the Bodhisattva being on the path to becoming a Buddha. And so that idea that when we go into seclusion and do samadhi practice in that way, we are taking those seven steps towards enlightenment. So um, the other thing really quickly too that I wanted to say about, it was about the whole thing about not, oh, there it is, uh, not having any cravings for friends or family or any attachments to the villages and all of that. You know, this isn't, that's not about you know, if you think about it really, really practically, <laughs> you just, you can't meditate and be having some wild conversation. <laughs> Meditation is a very personal, private, silent practice. And so the idea is, is that if, if you're not comfortable with not being with people in that way and communicating, it's just going to be very hard to reach those states of meditation. But again, just as a matter of the science of it <laughs> in that sense. So, all right, everybody doing okay with the fifth of these? Cool. And number six. Additionally, Shariputra. Bodhisattvas must be skilled in the causes that accord with insight, the pashyana. Wondering where insight comes from, they think insight arises from the basis of the vows of discipline. All virtuous phenomena increase in the presence of insight. Considering thus, they train in insight, meaning they train in the subjects of worldly affairs. They train in the subjects of worldly crafts, worldly arts, magic, medicine, and all the other subjects that are laborious and difficult to master. However, as they train in these topics of learning, they develop the following understanding. Worldly insight does not lead to renunciation, does not lead to detachment, to cessation, to peace, to knowledge, complete awakening, solitude, or to the passing beyond sorrow. So what type of insight might bring me peace? Whatever it may be, I must search for that type of craft, for that type of magic, for that type of medicine or insight. In this way, the Bodhisattva searches for the origin of things. However, when one is searching for the origin of things, one will find, one will fail to find any phenomena upon which another phenomena may rest. This failure to find anything will lead one to rest in complete peace. By experiencing this complete peace, one will not be discouraged 
by not being discouraged, one will consider the welfare of other beings. Due to acknowledging that, in order to bring peace and end the suffering of all beings, one must intentionally embrace existence. Shariputra, bodhisattvas who have these six qualities will swiftly and fully awaken to unsurpassed, perfect awakening. All right. That's the last. And again, the last is about pranya, about wisdom. They, at least our Tibetan English translators, put it in the language of insight or vipassana, and that's fine. But what I want you to notice is that, well, there was two parts. One, the bodhisattva studies everything. That is a part of the process. So there is no, uh, you know, um, it's just an, a part of the learning in that way, that it's not, it would be, yeah, learning about everything. But then we notice this thing where the bodhisattva then also realizes the shortcomings of certain worldly pursuits and says, you know what? I want a pursuit though that leads somewhere else in that way. And then what we get is, is that they think this way about searching for the origin of things. And I just want to read that again. When one is searching for the origin of things, one will fail to find any phenomena on which to rest or on which another phenomena may rest. This failure to find anything will lead one to rest in complete peace. So that's pranya. <laughs> so the insight, the vipassana, the work of insight is to investigate causation, to search where, are the, where is all this coming from? The bodhisattva will then, the idea is eventually realize when they're searching for the origin of things that they will not ever find one phenomena upon which other phenomena are built in that way. And that, of course, is the basic idea of dependent origination. But I would refer you once again, a number of Sundays ago, I gave a pretty extensive talk on the idea of no self, of anatman or anatta. And that talk, even though I was focusing on the idea of the self, it was the same exact pranya investigation where it was about trying to find that one little nugget that is you, that is the self, upon which the name is given, such as Michael, upon which the signifiers are given, uh, male, this or that. But the search for the root, that ends in realizing there is no first cause, as Aristotle would say. And part of the idea is, is that you could continue searching for that forever, if you would like to spin in samsara forever in that way. But the idea is, is that when you finally have that insight, that realization of emptiness, as it's called, the idea here is, is once again, the failure to find anything underneath all of that will lead one to rest in complete peace. That, that's why we would do that. <laughs> so, all right, everybody, we did it. We made it through all six. Oh, I actually, yeah. No, Tanya, please, I'd rather answer a question. Yeah. Uh, so there was also something in there about, if I heard it right, about not, um, or, or about um, engaging in normal life or something. Some, I'm Excellent. not saying it quite the right way. Excellent. That's exactly what I wanted to talk about. So we're on the same page. So it was about how by experiencing this complete peace of emptiness, one will not be discouraged. By not being discouraged, one will consider the welfare of other beings. 
And due to acknowledging that, in order to bring peace and end the suffering of all beings, one must intentionally embrace existence. So that's kind of, it's related to that idea of the Bodhisattva willingly coming back into samsara. It's related to that idea, but it's a little different because of its context. So the context of that statement of intentionally embracing existence, the context of that is the context of emptiness. And this, this comes up a lot. And I've, in so many uh, other nights, we've talked about this, but there is this idea of what is called the Pratekya Buddha, the, the, the solitary Buddha, who realizes emptiness, who realizes all of this. And when, if you really kind of grok emptiness in that way, you really get it. There's a certain sense in which you're like, well, how? The, yeah, there's no self, there's no you, there's no here, there's no there, there's no up, there's no down. That's the complete peace the Buddha was talking about. Bye, everybody. And there's a way in which, in light of emptiness, there's a way in which that makes total sense. So the Bodhisattva has to, quote, intentionally embrace existence in order to avoid that type of apathy of the Pratekya Buddha in that way. And that, again, has a lot to do with the vow to liberate all sentient beings, the transfer of merit I was talking about. All of that has to do with this. And yeah, because I have a minute or two, I want to mention this about the logic of all of that. It's, it's really kind of, oh, it's, it's so interesting. But and, and it's, I don't even really have anywhere near enough time to, to, to speak on it, really. But it's about this sort of, in my experience, and I'm really speaking just from my own insights now, um, obviously drawing from the Dharma in that way, but it's about like, it's sort of about thinking you know everything. And what I mean is, is that the, this emptiness idea is very profound, truly. And, and to have glimpses of it or to even really get it, there's a way in which you could almost feel like you've figured it all out. And there almost is a way in which you have. It's why they're called Buddha. I mean, Pratekya Buddhas are Buddhas, you know, for crying out loud. So... The idea, though, is, is that my experience with emptiness, with teaching emptiness, practicing, experiencing it, I have had even deeper realizations of the even more, how could I put this, the profoundly interconnected nature of all of this. <laughs> it's profound. And there's a way in which my feeling about it is, is that there's a way in which the Bodhisattva has that moment of insight where they really recognize how, how the investment in all other beings' enlightenment is being invested in their own enlightenment. It's actually the only way to accurately be <laughs> invested in the pursuit of enlightenment in that way. So that's kind of a last note about intentionally <laughs> embracing existence. So, <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank Nelly, you. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank yeah. you.